We're talking today with Rebecca Shalakis of Wyoming, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay. Can you start off with some background to begin with where and when were you born? Uh, I was born on November 14th, 1983 in Rochester, Michigan. Uh, my whole family is from that area. Mm -hmm. so. And did you grow up there? I did, in Romeo. Okay. And what did your family do for a living when you were growing up? My mother taught piano uh, and then eventually went on to her master's program for social work. My father worked for GM as a technician. Okay. And how many kids in the family? Myself and my brother. All right. Uh, and let's see. So uh, now where were you when 9-11 happened? I was actually at my parents' house. I was currently going to school for EMS and visiting with them for the weekend. I woke up and was watching the news when I got a phone call from a friend at the time. You know, might want to change the channel too. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of those very impactful moments where you call everybody together and we all watched when the second tower was hit. All right. Um, and then I guess you were at that point, so you were, you were training to do basically EMS was an mm -hmm. emergency medical service. Correct. Okay, so ambulance and, and that kind of exactly. thing. Uh, all right. Uh, now, how long after that did you decide to go into the military? I had always been intending on going into the military. It was one of those things that one day I'll get around to. Um, in 2005, I finally made the decision that I was at that point that I wanted to continue on with my career and, and move forward with the military decision. Okay, but have you been thinking about the military before 9-11 or? I have been planning on joining the military since I was two. Uh, it's very heavy in my family. So it was one of those things you always saw the photos of and heard the stories. and. The concept of service was very highly rated in my family. Okay, so which of your relatives had been in? Uh, my brother, my father, my, both of my grandfathers, uh, most of my uncles. It was very widespread. Okay, and were they in different branches of the service or all Army or? We've covered every branch but the Air Force. Okay, all right. Uh, and how did you wind up choosing the Army? My father was in the Army. My brother was in the Navy, so I had heard a lot of stories from both. I very much wanted to be a medic. That was the only job that I was interested in, so it automatically eliminated the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. um, and the Air Force, just with their job description, really wasn't what I was looking for. So I had the option of Army or Navy, and I'm not big on cramped ships, so that left me with the Army. Okay. Uh, now, were you signing up uh, to go in into the Guard or full-time active duty, or what was the plan? I went directly into the Guard. Uh, mostly at the recommendation of someone who was currently in the Guard at the time. It was going to allow me the opportunity to do my schooling and continue on with my civilian career as well as be able to, to provide some service. Okay, so now once you make the decisions, so it's 2005, you decide you're going to go in. Now what's the, what's the induction process and what happens to you? It was actually very quick for me. Uh, I went directly to a recruiter since they weren't trying to convince me of anything. It was a matter of come in, what do I need to do to sign? I already know what job I want, and there happen to be openings. So within about a month, month and a half, we had tested, and I was signed up. OK. Uh, and now they send you off for a basic training session next? Is that? The basic training um, was about six months later for me. OK. I wanted to complete some of my civilian training prior to that, but they brought me on full time as a recruiter's assistant. Mm -hmm. So I spent some time prior to, to leaving for basic training working with the military. And so what sort of a time commitment was that, or how often would you be in there? Uh, I signed up for six years. Um, the six months prior to my basic training deployment date, I worked full time Monday through Friday um, and one weekend a month with the recruiters. Okay, so you were not doing civilian job then, you're actually still you're with the military but I, working for the yes, recruiters. Yes, I left my civilian job at that time, I just couldn't do both. So. Okay, all right. Uh, and over the course of that six months with the recruiters, were you learning stuff that was useful or were you just killing time? There was a lot of useful learning. Uh, most recruiters have been in for quite some time. At that point, most had deployed. And you're, you're hearing a lot of the personal experiences, not the sales pitch. Mm -hmm. um, very, very helpful. Kind of kept you grounded as to what your expectations were. So I, I enjoyed it, and it was very informational. Okay. Now, uh, where do they send you for basic training? I went to Fort Leonard Wood. In Missouri, okay. in January. All right. And, and would you do your advanced training there or just basic? No, that was just basic. Okay. Uh, my AIT was down at Fort Sam Houston right. in Texas. Right, but they had just sent you down to Fort Sam for the whole thing, so you were doing basic. At, yeah, two at, separate at, places. At, at Leonard Wood, which is mostly an artillery place, right? Uh, a lot of MPs are there as well. So they already have Yeah. Actually, Fort Sill is artillery. Leonard right. Wood is engineers. 
Yes, uh, engineers and, and MPs. Okay, so you've got, you've got that. Um, describe a little bit. Well, first of all, I guess you, you get out to, to Leonard Wood. I mean, had you seen a big army base before or been on one of those? I before? had it. Um, I, I had no idea what to expect in the terms of my surroundings, but being fr a, a, the child of a lot of military individuals, um, you, you kind of understand the concept. You know it's basically a game. They're not going to kill you. They're not going to force you to do anything that's going to cause you to bodily harm. Um, and so it really wasn't that difficult. It wasn't that much of a shock just to keep your mouth shut and do what you're told. So. Okay. Uh, what kind of physical training were you getting? But prior to? Well, or once, uh, once, once, once you're in basic. Once I was in basic, it was pretty intensive, um, but they understood that when you first got there, you were not going to be in the epitome of fighting form. So they were pretty cognizant of that. They started relatively slow and worked your way up. Um, you had almost an exit exam. You had to perform a, a physical fitness test before they even sent you into the formal basic training portion. So mm -hmm. they made sure you were at least at a baseline level. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, did you have, were you with a, a company, your platoon training together, that were men and women mixed together, or? It was. It was mixed company. Okay. Um, and how did that wind up working? Actually, it winded up working very well. Um, women sometimes have a difficult time working together. Um, having a male presence was nice. It kind of kept some of the females grounded. Um, but some of the males that were having a hard time, they seemed to have difficulty speaking to one another. And oftentimes we would find ourselves as sounding boards mm -hmm. for men who were having trouble with spouses or with girlfriends at home. So there was definitely kind of give and take, and it worked out well, I think, for all of us. Okay. And what kind of gender balance was there? What proportion were women in your training unit? I would probably say about a third of us were female. Okay. All right. Uh, and did the, does the training differentiate at all between what they expect men to do and women to do, or were you doing all the same things? We all had the same tasks. The only times there was um, any sort of modification was for a record physical fitness test. Mm -hmm. And then the standards for most things are lowered for women. Other than that, it's all the exact same activities. Okay. How much emphasis do they put just on sort of discipline and following orders and that kind of thing? In the beginning, it's very, very strict. Uh, there's no leeway. There's no allowances in the beginning. As you continue on, there's a little more give and take, and you're allowed to speak up your mind a little bit more. Um, more enjoyably, you have true conversations with your drill sergeants as opposed to just following orders. Okay. Uh, and were these people who had been to Iraq or Afghanistan already, as far as you can tell? or Probably a 50-50 mix. Many of them had been, but many of them were assigned to, to drill sergeant school, which kept them from going to uh, deployments. All right. And, I don't know, were they, was this training now really still at a very general level, or was it done with an expectation that a lot of you might wind up in the Middle East? Or? The expectation was you are training for deployment. Okay. And was there stuff built into that training at, at that level that was based on experience over there, or was it not? Not for the most part, yeah. but the emphasis, the urgency was much more focused. The concept of first aid was it was real. It's not a, you may need this one day, it's you, you will need this one day. Okay. All right. And did people wash out of basic? We had a few that went AWOL. Um, no one we had actually washed out, but the AWOL remained behind, be recycled. Mm -hmm. So you just go through another one, but you're yeah. not, then you're moving entirely. Okay. Uh, and then how long was the basic? Basic was eight weeks. Okay. Nine if you count the, the ceremony and leaving. Right. Okay. Uh, and then straight to Fort Sam Houston next? Straight to Fort Sam Houston. Long bus ride all the way down. Okay. That's in San Antonio? Correct. Okay. Uh, now, uh, how was that experience, how does that experience compare to the one at Leonard Wood? You know, it's, it was very similar in the sense of the expectations and the rigidity. It, they understood that you weren't fully qualified as soldiers and they treated you as such. But at the same time, you, you were given allowances as time went on. They relaxed the rules a bit. You were allowed to leave post and things like that. The training for us is four months long. And because it is a longer uh, job training, they understand you're going to be there forever. And they start to give you a little more freedom as time goes on. You prove that you're not you know, a troublemaker. 
So you can get off the base periodically and... Yeah, after the first month, month and a half, they, they allow you passes. You can leave the weekend and come back. Okay. What's the training actually consist of? The first month to month and a half is all the civilian standards for the National EMT Registry. So once you complete that, they'll move you on to what they call the whiskey portion. That is all your Army medic tasks, which is primarily focused on trauma, and they spend a good two, two and a half months focusing on that. Okay. And how would they go about that? I mean, if you're trying to do you know, combat injuries or, or things like that, how, how do you practice that? A lot of it was morning PowerPoints and then afternoon exercises. Uh, they would put out mannequins or moulaged individuals that they would throw out you know, in a field or in a truck, and they would give you a scenario, and the expectation was that you would go in and perform your measures just as you would if it was a real person. Okay. Did they have any kind of priority system for like what kind of casualties you deal with first? I'm afraid I don't understand. Well, okay, I've been interviewing people who went to Vietnam, and had somebody who was a Navy corpsman explained that uh, you know you were given several people who were injured, and mm -hmm. part of the test was, well, who do you help first? Ah, yes, the, the triaging portion yes. of injuries. Yeah. Uh, that is one of the first things that they really focus on teaching, because that's going to be the first skill that you use but even before you do any sort of medical care. So it's, triage was a very, very big focus and being able to differentiate between the severity of injuries. Yeah, and what this particular fellow found disturbing was that he was supposed to deal with the least injured first, because they could still fire a weapon. They can still be utilized. Yeah. Um, one of the things they focus on now is self-care and being able to direct people in a large, there's a large group that have been injured, being able to direct them to provide their own care so that those that are more trained can focus on the more injured. So it's, it's kind of evolved a little bit, but there is still a very rapid triage where you shouldn't, shouldn't take more than really four to six seconds to be able to evaluate the likelihood of somebody's living and if their injuries are too severe you just are expected to walk past. Okay. Now how much did your own background and training help you at, at this stage? Not a lot actually. It was, it was quite frustrating. The civilian standard is very different from the military standard. Um, both it focused more on medical as well as they were allowed to do a lot more in certain aspects but you were much more limited in others. Going through with the military training you had to segregate what you're allowed to do on the civilian side versus what you're allowed to do on the military. So it's keeping two totally different jobs separate and that mm -hmm. became actually a bit of a hindrance. Okay. Now, uh, were there other people you were training with who also had experience like yours or was it kind of unusual for someone to have EMS training being trained as a medic? That was a little less usual. Um, at the time there was a lot of young soldiers coming in. It wasn't often you had someone who was 22, 23 and had already been out in the field before. So the, I was the only one at the time who had any medical experience. All right. Uh, and now you kind of, and then when you were doing that now were they, were you being taught by people who had done this kind of work in the field now? Yes, all of them that were teaching, all instructors were medics. The majority of them had served in theater in some capacity. Um, there were a few that hadn't, mm -hmm. but most of them had been in for quite some time. I guess it would probably vary what sort of experience they'd have. Exactly, very individual. Okay, so you get through you know, four months of that. Mm -hmm. Now, as somebody who's in the Guard, are you just go back to civilian life at that point, or what happens? Once you're released, you come back, you report to your duty company with the Guard, inform them that you're here, mm -hmm. return in all your packets, and then you, you get your drill schedule and you go home. Okay, and then um, and what unit were you assigned to at that point? I was assigned to the 1171st Area Support Medical Company out of Ypsilanti. Okay. Uh, and what kind of responsibility or job did they have? They actually provide most of the medical services for Michigan. There's only one other medical company. And so we end up doing vaccinations. We do the um, health assessments for all soldiers, all the soldier readiness, as well as the expectation that if we were called to duty for deployment, we would run up a, basically a field hospital. Okay. Uh, and then how long were you kind of doing the weekend warrior thing with that group? 
I actually am still with that unit. Okay, you're um, still with it. I have been tasked out to other units temporarily, mm -hmm. but I have always been primarily assigned to the 1171st. Okay, and did that become, did, did that company ever get mobilized as a company, or did it, you, you just get individuals taken and assigned places? They got mobilized as a company as I was leaving AITV, past each other on okay. planes. Um, I was injured at the time, and I was expecting surgery, so I was not called to deploy with them. So I remained behind on your detachment. Okay, uh, and I don't know what was what was your response to that? I mean, had you do you want to have been able to go with them? Or I wanted very badly to go with them, uh, but the amount of time it was going to take for the recovery process was not going to allow my deployment. Okay, and was this an accident or? Actually, it was um, it was a bunion caused by military boots. Ah. <laughs> so it actually one of those very silly things that unfortunately kept me behind. Yeah, so not, not, not really glamorous or anything? No, no nothing glamorous. Yeah. Okay, uh, so when were they over? That was in 2006, okay. summer of 2006. Okay, and do you know what they wound up doing or where they went? I don't remember exactly where they went. They were in Iraq. Um, I'm not sure exactly where they were and they ran a field hospital there. Okay, all right. And so, if they're over there and you're back in the States, mm -hmm. then I don't, do they even have drill weekends at that point? They do. They, for anyone who's remaining behind, uh, they have to have a rear de detachment right. to run ops at home. And anyone who's left behind, either due to health reasons or personal reasons, um, you, you run the company at home and you maintain the standards and the needs of the state for things like the immunizations. And That's such. true, because they're still, you're still providing under your normal services Correct. for all the other units. Okay. Uh, and then how long did you wind up doing that? Uh, that was for about six months, and I was tasked out to the Regional Training Institute. So I moved on from there to... And then where was that? That's um, RTI is out of Battle Creek, and they primarily do reclassification for soldiers who are wanting to change jobs. Okay. And what do you have to do for them? I was their, their medical non-commissioned officer in charge. I ran sick call. I ensured that their ranges were able to run due to medical personnel, uh, line of duty packets, and just general medical support for the company. Okay. And um, now, when you're doing that kind of thing, is that still part-time guard duty or? That, that was full-time. That was full-time. You're, you're tasked full -time. to them, so you're doing that full-time. Correct. Okay. And how long were you doing that? I did that for about seven, eight months and then went back to the 1171st. Okay, uh, and at this point, are you wondering if you're ever gonna to get to go someplace? I had actually put myself on the national deployment list in the hopes that somebody somewhere would need a medic and would pick me up. Um, but it wasn't until 2007 that I received notification that I was up for deployment. Okay, and what unit were you gonna be assigned to then? The 1463rd Transportation Company out of Wyoming. Okay, uh, and so once you find out, then, then what do you do in terms of joining them or integrating into the unit or whatever? There was um, kind of, I was living out of state at the time, so there was a bit of a lengthy process to get medically cleared. Uh, they did the paperwork to transfer me over to the unit in uh, early 2008. And then I just transfer. I go to the 1463rd, I started training with them and getting my medical training up to snuff before we left. Okay, and so at this point they have orders for deployment to Iraq, was that, was that, okay. And so what are they actually teaching you about what you're going to come up against? What kind of preparation do they make? Medics are required to go through a medical refresher course, if you will. At the time it was a month long, and you go back down to Fort Sam and you do a field out for about a month, retrain on all your medic skills, and then we would join our unit, and the unit trained on convoy operations, um, ambushes, IEDs, things like that, mm -hmm. and you get all of your deployment classes out of the way to make sure that you're ready for anything you may come up against. They had an operation for detainee ops. Uh, that was their primary goal. So much of what we had to do was go through basically prison training mm -hmm. and learn how to work with detainees, work how to provide medical care through a fence, um, play guards. We're talking about a transportation company though, yes. right? Okay, you want to explain yes. that? I actually can't. <laughs> I, I, to this day, am wondering how that happened. Um, my guess is just they were up for deployment. They didn't have guards available, an infantry unit or an MP unit, and 
Congratulations, you're going to learn how yeah. to be a guard. All right. Uh, okay, so then um, how much time did you spend with them before you had to deploy to Iraq? I actually only spent about a month, month and a half training with them. Um, I was training, but it was the medical training that yeah. we did on our own. Yeah. And were they still training in Michigan, or were they sent somewhere else? That was down in Texas at Fort Bliss. Okay. El Paso, that area? El Paso, yes, for Gregor Range. Okay. Uh, now, did they use, was the terrain in some way suitable for preparing for Iraq? Or? It was. For those of us, especially for being from Michigan, you're just not used to sand. <laughs> and lots of sand and lots of heat. Uh, it was definitely a nice kind of adjustment and acclimatization to really what you were going to be dealing with. All right. And so they do that for a month or so. That was the time yes. there with them. Okay. Right. Uh, and now what happens to you? Packed up and we flew out to Kuwait where we stayed there for about a week and a half, two weeks, um, doing your in-processing into country and waiting for a flight that could take us out to Iraq. Okay. And were they trying to get you acclimated while you were there? Part of it is acclimatization, um, but you're only there for a week. There's not a whole lot that is going to happen in a week. Okay. And now were you expecting to, to go in, in, into prison guard duty? Was that the... That was, we had already been warned that our, our mission was detainee ops. Um, okay. So I knew that I'd be working on a prison. I knew I'd be working with detainees for medical care. And that's all that we were given. Okay. Uh, do you have people in the unit who can speak Arabic or that? Or are you just going to get somebody assigned to you maybe? They had interpreters. Yeah. Um, usually they used local nationals as interpreters um, throughout the compounds. Okay. All right. So you were waiting and so you fly up to Iraq, out of yes. Kuwait, okay, Correct. and to Baghdad or somewhere else? Actually, we flew into uh, Camp Buka, and near Umm Qasar. It was right near the Kuwait border, okay. uh, right on the Persian Gulf. Okay, so that's not a very long flight. Well, no, a very quick flight via helicopter. Oh, okay. So, quick jump across. All right, and is that where you were going to be assigned? That, that was, that that was where... So, so what was going on around there at that time? Activity-wise, there wasn't a whole lot, but Camp Buka really was created as a prison facility. Um, it had been there for a few years, but it was very built up. Uh, and a lot of the activity was so much farther north that it was relatively quiet where we were at the time. Now, were they bringing detainees from other areas into this place? Usually they were flown in. Uh, most of the detainees that we had, there was three separate rows of detainees. The majority were people who were waiting for trials, so there, they were, there was no verdict for them. Then you did have a very small prison population of those that have been convicted and we need maximum security because that's primarily what we did. Other than that, they stayed up north um, at Taji. Right. And um, as medic, what did you find yourself doing with this group? For the first two months, I spent working in a the theater internment facility. My primary responsibility was to run a medical clinic for roughly 200 detainees, um, provide medical care for about 10 hours a day, evaluations, medications, basic okay. hospital care. All right, and so are you in, in charge of other people who are providing treatment, or are you actually treating these people yourself? Or? No, we were treating ourselves. There was, on average, two medics assigned per compound for 200 detainees. You would have a PA that would come out twice a week to review any medical records, to answer any questions that you had, or see something that you just weren't sure how to treat. Okay. And what kinds of, of problems or issues did you have to deal with? Oh, you saw everything. Uh, skin conditions was a big one. Um, a lot of injuries. They were allowed to play soccer quite frequently. And there was a lot of just toe lacerations, broken noses. A lot of colds, allergies, eye issues, you name it, it was there. All right. And how did these people behave? If you're trying to treat them, how did they regard you? I actually had a very good relationship with my detainees. The mentality of you're neither judge nor jury got you very far in that environment. It's a game to them. They're, they're looking to get something from you, to take advantage of you if, if you give them the opportunity. But giving them a little bit of respect, I found that I got quite a bit in return. Um, they actually were, were very kind to me in many ways. 
And I guess you were actually doing something good for them, too, which yes. is the, the, the other part of it, and the rest yes. of them maybe not, not so much. Uh, what, what's, how would you describe the facilities that they were in? I mean, we hear you heard a lot from early in the war about Abu Ghraib and all of that yes. kind of stuff and overcrowding and the rest. What kind of facility was this? They actually, um, they had longhouses. Um, they were cinder block and wood construction. They had sleeping mats. Um, they actually had pretty decent uh, accommodations. There was television available. They had checkers and chess and games. Uh, they were released usually throughout the day to go to, to clinics like wood shops or art. So they actually had a pretty decent arrangement. All right. And what were they detained for? Do you have any idea? For any number of things. Um, on my count, compound, it could be anything from you were simply in the wrong place at the wrong time and they rounded up everybody of your description and they had yet to clear you, down to you were seen and placing an IED or planning something that, that they were able to find out about. Okay. Uh, did you have any contact with the people who were in maximum security? The only time I had contact with them was during flu season when we did flu inoculations or on the occasions that I'd work the special housing unit. There were some people that were also stationed there. And if you deal with them, do you have guards around or things like that? At all times, no matter where you're at, you would always have a guard present. Um, the only time you did not was if you were working with your detainees through the fence. But if for any reason you had to deal with them one-on-one -on -one or outside of the segregated, fenced environment, you always had a guard present. Mm -hmm. All right. And what were your own kind of living conditions like there? There were uh, pods, shoes, that had four to six men per, uh, roughly 15 by 20 of steel construction. Not bad, you know, air conditioning, you have a bed, not a whole lot to complain about, showers. It's actually quite nice, all things considered. Okay, and I mean, how many Americans were sort of based there, do you think? Oh, I couldn't even begin to guess. Um, it was a small installation a mile by mile square. Mm -hmm. um, half of it was the detention center, the other half was soldiers, and it was packed. Okay, so it is, it's a base for units other than, so it's not just a prison facility, there are regular soldiers there? There, there were some others, um, but the primary purpose was detention facility and a training center for the Iraqi corrections officers, Iraqi medical, medical officers, and it was a base for the Air Force's area security. Okay. Now, how much interaction did you have with any of the Iraqi personnel? Actually, we had the Iraqi medical officers that were assigned to us. So they were going through training, and they would end up working with us on a daily basis. Okay. And what impression did you have of them? I got along with them quite well. Um, again, it's open to their culture and, and mm -hmm. learning about it. They asked a lot of questions about us. I asked questions about them, and you kind of become friends. They, they worked out quite well. And how did they sort of respond to having sort of female military personnel there? A little uncertain. They seem to not know how to handle you. Uh, your position is such that you appear as a male, but you're very obviously female. Usually after the first week or two, they seem to really kind of come around, starting to do things like bringing you food and, and being able to actually talk with you and open enough to ask questions. Okay. Now, would any of them speak English, or did you have trans just translators? or? We fumbled a lot with kindergarten uh, style language. Mm -hmm. I had learned some basic Arabic. They were learning basic English and a lot of charades. You know, very extended periods of time of just laughing, trying to figure out what somebody was saying. Okay. Now, do you have uh, any sense or do they have knowledge of what the larger situation, the military situation in Iraq was while you were there? They did. I mean, every, everyone understood. Um, a lot of the movements. We had TV, you could see what was going on, you could see the public's response to it. Um, you have a job to do, you're there regardless of politics, mm -hmm. and everybody pretty much understood that. And how did things seem to be going while you were there? Were they going up or down or staying the same? They were pretty much staying the same. Um, there was a lot of understanding from the local population that we weren't going to be there forever. The basic consensus was eventually we're going to have to leave and everyone that we basically had chased out of the country was going to come right back. So they didn't feel that what we had accomplished would last. All right. Now, do you spend your whole tour there or? I spent my entire tour at Buka, but I only spent two months on the theater internment facility. 
The rest I spent working with the Air Force on area security. Okay, so talk about that. What was uh, that? How did you wind up with that assignment and what were you doing? They had an opening for, they were looking for medics uh, for their squads that were going out. And the prison is exhausting. It's a very exhausting job. And I was interested in getting out, so I volunteered for an opening with them, and they accepted me on and started working with the Air Force. Okay. I guess with, with the prison and the, the exhaust, I mean, you were talking before about dealing with the prisoners or through the wire or, or whatever. I mean, was that how most of your interaction worked there on one side of the fence and you're on the other? Yes. You, okay. You're treating medically through a fence. Okay. Establish that. All right. <laughs> So, and I, I guess that, that's got to be kind of a strange sort of situation to be operating in, I would think. It's a very strange situation, yeah. especially when you're a medic and you're used to being very hands-on with your patients, and now you have a fence, you're reaching in between bars to deal with them. But again, we had a pretty good relationship. You know, they built me a wood bench mm -hmm. and a sunshade to sit down on so I could be comfortable. <laughs> um, it, it actually was a very good situation once we worked out how to do it. Okay. But ultimately, it was wearing enough that if you had another option, in this case, the Air Force. As, as good as they were and as well as they treated me, they're still prisoners. They're still bored the majority of the day. And if they can get something, get a comfort, they're going to. So they're always looking to kind of pull one over on you, get more than what you're really willing to give. So. All right. So now what is the Air Force assignment? The Air Force assignment was being assigned to a squad of between 10 and 14 individuals, four trucks, that would go out and do just area security. We would tour the area, keep an eye on the roads, do coin operations, you know, winning the hearts and minds of the locals, visiting with them, uh, looking for things like IEDs or UXOs. Okay, now what kind of area is this in terms of just sort of how developed it was or what the geography was like? This is the middle of nowhere. Um, the Umkasar area is very underdeveloped. You do have some small cities, but they're very small, um, and the majority of people are kind of living a farming life. How? I don't know. <laughs> they are. Yeah, I mean, is there water supply somewhere? No. There's the Persian Gulf, yeah. which is not far away at all, but there's not a whole lot of rivers, there's not a lot of rainfall. Um, it's, it's very much just a flat, desolate place. All right. And are they... But they were growing something? They're, they were farmers. They grew tomatoes and cucumbers primarily. So that was their staple diet. Okay. And how much sort of, was, it, was there much um, hostile activity around there? There wasn't a lot. Um, it was starting to ramp up a little bit as we were leaving. Uh, most of what we found were hoax UXOs, really testing to see how we'd respond. Um, there was some sniper activity, but it was aimed primarily at the Iraqi police. Not at us. Okay. Uh, and I guess with when you're going, you're patrolling and going into the communities, do you have Iraqis going with you or do you do this by yourselves? That's just us. It's a um, very uncomfortable feeling. You are not always welcome in the cities. Okay, so it would be a group of just like a few trucks going together? or Four trucks. Four trucks. That's it. And what kind of armament did they have, if any? They were up armored Humvees. Okay. Um, we were always armed with one to two fifty cals and two 240 Bravos that were mounted on the vehicles. We all had our own weapons. Um, but that's that's it. Okay. Now, as a medic, do you carry a weapon? I do. I carry both an M4 as well as an M9. Okay, and, and for the uninitiated, what's an M4 and what's an M9? Uh, a rifle and a pistol. Okay. All right. Uh, and was that standard in that area? That was standard. For anyone going outside the wire, you would carry both weapons. All right. Uh, and and would you do foot patrols or just stay in the vehicles? or? It was primarily vehicle, but because we were there to do coin operations and really kind of communicate with the people around us, we would do a lot of stopping and visiting. Um, if there was something like the opening of a medical clinic, we would try to stop by and make a presence, you know, well wishes and things like that. Try to create some sort of good feeling between the community and us. And what sort of feeling was there in the community? Mixed, very mixed. Some people absolutely loved us and appreciated what we were doing, and many people did not for a variety of reasons. But it was not uncommon to find yourself in the middle of a mob or have bricks being thrown at you or rotten food. It was a, a huge mixture of a feeling towards us. 
Okay. And if you're in the middle of a mob, are you just inside the vehicles and push through them? or? Generally what we'd end up doing is anyone who is not driving the vehicle or manning one of the mounted, the mounted weapons would step out of the vehicle and walk alongside, um, both to try and communicate with those around us. We do a very slow roll through the town, we, giving us the time to chan, you know, chat with the people around us, maybe meet with the heads of the cities. But if things just started getting too uncomfortable and there's that sense of a potential for violence to occur, uh, we would just try to get in the vehicles and leave. Our goal was not to incite anything. Okay, and um, sometimes did that you wind up in more violent situations? You do, um, and sometimes you don't even know how they occur. One minute you're chatting with people, the next you're just surrounded by people pushing in and kind of reaching for your weapons and trying to take things. You don't know if it's harmless or not, uh, but it's something that you have to consider it a hostile action. All right. Um, and at some point, you, you came out with a, a Purple Heart, right? Uh, that was not during that deployment. That, that was, was a different deployment. Was another deployment. Okay. And this one. So, I mean, did things get, did your units take casualties when you were out doing that kind of thing? All of our injuries were not combat injuries. Okay. Um, so, fortunately, we were able to keep pretty much everybody in theater with us. All right. And during roughly what time frame were you doing that work with the Air Force? That was the summer of 08 through the summer of 09. Okay. And so you get, are there particular things that are going to stand out in your mind about that tour uh, that we haven't brought into the story yet? You know, honestly, just the interaction with the locals. We spent a lot of time visiting them in their homes, and the majority of them were just very hospitable. These, these people had nothing, they were dirt poor, and yet they never hesitated to share whatever they had with us. Um, it was very enlightening. It was something that you really needed to experience to be able to understand and kind of change the way we look at our own culture. Mm -hmm. And you're also going to get to see them as people and not mm -hmm. just as... And vice versa. Yeah. We, they understand that we're not just faceless soldiers, that a lot of us do care. And you get to see them as, again, as people and realize that there isn't a whole lot of differences. We're pretty much all the same. All right. How would you characterize the, the morale of the American units that you were serving with in the time you were there? How were they holding up in that situation? It, it declined a lot. People, I would watch the Air Force come and go because their tours were much shorter than ours. And they would come in very motivated, very positive, but that environment just wears on you after a while. By the time you leave, it was our. We were so restricted in what we were allowed to do that it really chafed a lot of people. And you're spending a lot of time confined in a pretty small space. You're confined in a very small space. Um, our rules of engagement were so limited that we were afraid if we got into a situation, if we fired our weapons, that we would be penalized for it. So it just creates an anxiety of you're not sure what to do. Um, and that, that weighs on a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Did the camp itself get hit with mortars or anything else while you were there? There were a few attempts at uh, breaching the gates. Uh, usually it was a vehicle that had been armed um, to go off at the gate and the, the intent to break through. Um, nothing was ever successful though. Okay, but on the whole, not a whole, not a lot of that kind of activity going on then? It was almost impossible. Uh, the land there was so flat that we could see for such a long distance. It, emplacement or attack of that base was very difficult. Mm -hmm. And how easy or hard was it to communicate with people back home while you were there? Very easy. Uh, we had internet access, there were phone banks, um, USOs were always open, you could Skype with them. So we had pl plenty of opportunities to speak with family and friends. All right, uh, and so by the time you, you get to the end of your year, are you ready to go home? Mixed feelings. You're ready to go home, but at the same time, you've created friendships. You create relationship, relationships with people. Um, some of the kids that I dealt with, that you know, to this day I miss. I wonder what happened to. Uh, you know, you're never going to see them again, and that's kind of sad. Mm -hmm. And you wonder if the people coming after you are going to maintain what you've worked for. So there's a, a lot of mixed feelings about leaving. Mm -hmm. Now, as you were going out in the community, I mean, would you do? as a medic, kind of clinics for the locals or things like that? Was that part of the job? 
It was and it wasn't. Uh, we weren't allotted any funds for supplies to be able to take care of this. Uh, a lot of the clinics did not want our assistance because people who utilized them would be targeted. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, visiting with individual families, they were more than happy to take whatever we had to offer. And as soon as they found out I was a medic, they would usually try to, to bring up small issues. So I would do anything from joint exams and give them physical therapy regimens to um, treating burns and lacerations that had festered and things like that. But it's not part of what you're officially doing over there. It was not the official job. Um, we just all had agreed that we had a hard time walking away from somebody who was actively asking for help. Right. Okay. Again, back to some of that, the, the morale issue with the Air Force people. Did they find it odd to be in the Air Force and be patrolling on the ground in Humvees? It, actually, I don't think they did. Uh, for the most part, they were security forces. Okay. So most of them were basically like an MP. Yeah. And had spent the majority of their time doing patrols and, and guarding, so. And how long would they stay in country? They were in theater for four to six months. Okay. As opposed to your full year or some of the Yeah, you watch them come and go and you're still there. All right. Uh, now, how do they then, when it's your unit's turn to go out, then what's mm -hmm. the out processing like? The out processing for us was actually a little different than most units. That was at the time we were really pushing a drawdown. So anyone who was non-essential personnel was pushed into Kuwait so that the numbers would reflect a much lower deployed personnel in a combat zone. So we actually spent, most of us spent a month in Camp Virginia because we were non-essential while we waited for the essential personnel to finish up and meet up with us. Okay, and how do you spend your time in that month? Uh, it's, it was such a long month. Um, you basically go to the gym, you eat, you sat at Starbucks and would Skype with people at home or chat on the internet with friends, uh, eat a lot of Taco Bell. It's, it really was just kind of languishing in the middle of nowhere for a month. Okay. Uh, and then uh, when they bring you back to the States, mm -hmm. and then there is their debriefing or out processing that goes on there before you go back to civilian life? There is. Um, at, in New Jersey, um, we spent about two weeks, uh, three weeks doing the out processing. You have to go through extensive briefings um, and benefits updates, out processing for medical, finance, and yeah, the, the entire gamut. And then you're sent home. Okay. Uh, and then one, once you got back home, what did you do? <sighs> what did I do when I came back home from that deployment? Um, actually, I signed up for school. I enrolled at Macomb Community College started picking up classes again and trying to get back into um, my civilian careers. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you did, did you have a job at that point too? or I didn't. I applied at Macomb Community College not long after I started going to school there and they brought me on as an EMS lab aide for mm -hmm. their EMT program. But that was a contingent position, uh, so you, you pick up extra duty with the unit for cash as soon as whenever you can. but. It was kind of odd jobs for a while. Okay, but now eventually you, you go on a second deployment. I do. Okay, and how does that come about? There was a phone call from a friend of mine who was evaluating the 507th Engineer Battalion for their deployment and had noticed that they were very short on medics. Knowing that I wanted to deploy, uh, she gave me a call, let me know that they were looking for people, and so I called my commander and said, I heard 507th needs medics, I want to go. He gave me the go-ahead and we started the paperwork. All right, and so when was that this happened? That was uh, early 2011 when I requested for the transfer. Uh, I found out around August or September that it had been approved, and about October was when I had formally joined the 507. Okay, uh, and now are they in training for Afghanistan at this point? Or? They have been training for Afghanistan for almost a year at that point. Okay, and where were they doing their training? Uh, they did their training at the National Training Institute, or Training Center, NTC, uh, out west. Mm -hmm. uh, I was not there for that, uh, but then they came home and they, they picked up the training on the weekends uh, for their weekend drills and preparation. Okay. And so how long were you doing that before you shipped out? Uh, we shipped out in late spring of 2012, um, and we were training almost full time up until then. Okay. But, so it's like about six months, six months or, so or so of... Intensive training. Okay, uh, and 
what kind of preparation are they giving you for going to Afghanistan? It was very similar. Um, we have, the medics had to go to their specific training. Uh, we completed that, came back, and then joined the unit again at Fort Bliss in, in McGregor Range. Though this time it was much more focused on the mission. Um, it wasn't uh, detaining operations, it was um, looking for IEDs, and it was supporting the engineer companies whose route clearance mission um, was high priority at the time. So it much more tailored um, to a soldier task that mm -hmm. people were kind of used to. So we're able to run operations as though we would in theater in practice as opposed to learning something brand new the way a transportation had to. And how much were they trying to teach you about just Afghanistan and, and the conditions there? There wasn't a whole lot on kind of local geography or culture. They do have some classes, so you have a, a brief understanding. But our mission was not really to interact with the locals all that much, so that wasn't the primary focus for training. Yeah, so they re you're really going over there for road clearance? And it, was, it was route clearance and the support of route clearance. That was our only goal. Okay. Now, were you assigned to the battalion's headquarters or to one of the companies? Or I was assigned to battalion. Um, this, females were not allowed in combat arms units. Um, even though that change was kind of being made, it still was very strictly enforced. So all females had to be in battalion headquarters. All right. Uh, did you find that frustrating? Yes. <laughs> yes, I did. Um, I very much like working in the field. I like being a field medic. I, while I'm fully capable in a clinic, that's not what I like to do. Mm -hmm. And to be told that I was not allowed to, to work on route clearance because I was female is, is very frustrating. It's almost penalizing me for my gender. Yeah. What sort of range of views do you see in terms of how the male personnel view female personnel? It's mixed. Um, when you're dealing with people who aren't used to having females in the military, usually the initial reaction is, we don't want to be bothered with it. Um, though at the same time, after about two weeks of working with them, I've never had anyone not say that they wanted me around. Um, you develop a relationship, their views begin to change a little bit. So long as you prove yourself, that's all they care about. So It varies, but usually once you've worked with them for a while, they. They tend to see the value. All right. Uh, so you've got, you, you train with the unit, and now how do they get you out to Afghanistan? Uh, we flew out to Afghanistan. Um, we were in Manus for about a week or two uh, for the acclimatization and the in processing briefs. And then they flew us into Camp Leatherneck near Lashkargah in Helmand. Okay. And Manus, what was that? Or where is it? Now, that's an Air Force base. In I can never pronounce it, Kazakhstan, um, one of the bordering countries. Oh, okay, so Uzbekistan or Tajikistan or one of those states. Well, yeah, I yeah. can't oh, oh, pronounce okay. them. Yeah, uh, and, all right, and so, and then Camp Leatherneck is, is, is where you go, and we'd be based Correct. there, or? That, that is where we were, we were based out of. Um, our sister company that is our sister company in Michigan um, actually got pulled out from underneath us and assigned to another battalion. Um, they were a little farther east, but we were all in there together. All right, and what sort of end of the country is this in? If you this is southern. Uh, Helmand Province is south, slightly southwest, um, near the Pakistan border. Mm -hmm. um, Leatherneck is almost due west of Kandahar. All right, and what was the situation there when you got there? Leatherneck is a huge installation. It's attached to Camp Bastion and a few other installations of varying nationalities. And if you don't get off the installation, you don't really get to see a lot. Uh, but with our mission being primarily about clearance and recovery operations, when we left, we never dealt with locals um, for what we were doing. So I was really unaware of the political climate, um, though working in a battalion aid station um, where I spent the majority of my time, we got a lot of the honor flight emails, um, a lot of the notifications of the injuries coming through. We were responsible for tracking every single soldier that experienced a blast uh, within our brigade uh, and that was was a very overwhelming experience. You see these names coming through, you see these injuries, you're tracking, is it their first blast, their second, their fifth? Um, and you're seeing these repeat injuries and these soldiers going out again. Um, so you recognize that there's a lot going on but it's difficult to see the big picture when you're not really immersed in the cities. Right. 
Uh, was there a, a lot of enemy activity, or were there a lot of explosions? And there were a lot of names coming through, um, a, a lot of injuries. Um, we were fortunate, in a sense, that within our battalion, they were relatively low, um, but our sister company did sustain uh, a fatality uh, and had to send a couple out via medevac for, for blast injuries. Um, I myself was sent out via medevac about two months in, uh, for a blast injury. So it was relatively common to experience the blast. The injury aspect was much lower. Uh, we were much more prepared in Afghanistan than we were in Iraq. So people were able to experience repeated blasts. Okay. Well, what prepares you for experiencing blasts? Primarily our, our equipment. Um, the vehicles were designed so that they were able to mitigate the blast pressures. Um, they had add-on equipment that could detonate an IED before people got into a critical area. So a lot of the immediate injuries were diffused. Mm -hmm. Okay, now what happened to you? I was, um, our medics rotated on missions. So you were based out of a battalion aid station and when your name came up you were on the next mission. Uh, we had spent about a week moving a company from one camp to another that was a couple hours away. Um, wrapping up our, our last operations, we were headed home and about 15 clicks outside of Camp Leatherneck. Uh, my vehicle, which was fourth in the convoy, uh, rolled over a pressure plate IED. Um, went off pretty much directly under my feet where I had been sitting. Um, and uh, our vehicle was very much disabled. <laughs> so, um, very interesting experience. Okay, and what, did you have concussion or other kind of injury, or what happened to you? The, the immediate reaction was I knew that I had injured my feet. Um, you could feel just the heat and the pain, and you, you know that something is wrong. Um, my gunner was, was very distraught. Um, he was screaming that he was injured. Uh, and when I realized that he had retained all his, all his limbs at least, mm -hmm. um, kind of done a once-over, he was, was very personally traumatized with the fact that he felt it was his responsibility to see it and that he was unable to warn us. Um, so he was, was very upset with himself. Um, my driver and truck commander both sustained um, mild TBIs from that. My gunner had a knee strain to his left knee from objects in the vehicle that, that hit his knee. I had six closed fractures on my right foot, two open on my left, an L4, L5 injury, um, and a head injury. So we... What's an L4, L5 injury? Uh, low back, your lumbar okay. spine. All right. Um, so there was uh, a, basically a bulging disc. Mm -hmm. They'd slipped a disc um, in the blast. As I understand, I, I wasn't there to witness it because I was inside the vehicle. Uh, but as I understand, our vehicle was picked up and thrown about 10 feet from where we initially had been uh, driving um, and was completely disabled. But as nobody was horrendously critically wounded, uh, just treated my, my gunner's knee and got that stabilized and we transferred to another vehicle after they had cleared the area. Um, and Did your vehicle in. flip over or just bounce? It just picked straight up and, and moved elsewhere. We, we landed the same way we were driving, right side up. So a lot of the injuries were just from kind of bouncing around in, in the vehicle or the initial impact of the blast, but not shrapnel flying through no, the middle. No, our, our vehicle was not breached by shrapnel at all. Uh, it blew off the back axle and blew off the back door. Um, the vehicle was completely destroyed, uh, but it mitigated all, all shrapnel. So what we experienced was the blast pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, that was really what primarily caused the majority of the injuries. Yeah. And so that's the, and so that was what kept coming through at the, the aid station, was those and kinds that's, of, of yeah, things. Yeah, that's what we were saying. Yeah, which is better than it could have been if you'd had thinner skinned vehicles. Much, much. The, we were much more prepared with this. As, uh, we had the, the up armored vehicles, we had the MRAPs and the MAX Pros, whereas in Iraq we were still dealing with Humvees and flat bottom vehicles that were just not prepared for blasts. Okay. Now, did this injury, did that? end your tour or did you just? That ended my tour. Um, we, we drove out. Uh, I did not want to fly out and leave my, my guys without a medic. Mm -hmm. uh, we still had 16 clicks to go. Um, so I denied a medevac request. We loaded up in another vehicle, drove back in, finished the mission. Um, 
and once we had notified command of what had happened, they were waiting at the gate for us. So as soon as we rolled in through the gate, we went. Those of us that were in the blast went directly from the recovery truck uh, to their vehicles, and they drove us to the hospital. Okay. And did you just get treated there? Or did you get sent back home? Or we were all initially treated at Camp Bastion. Um, my driver, my truck commander, my gunner all stayed in, in theater because they were able to receive some TBI treatment there and go back to duty. I was flown out through Kandahar Air Force Base um, for two surgeries to clean and stabilize my feet. And then I was sent out to Andrews Air Force Base where they redirected me to Fort Belvoir, Virginia. Okay. And why would you go there? Uh, I was at Fort Belvoir. Um, it was a toss-up between Walter Reed and Belvoir. And I, I kind of fell into a, an odd status. I was more injured than a lot of people at Belvoir, primarily were seeking help for things like PTSD mm -hmm. um, and TBIs, where I had the physical injuries that would fit better with Walter Reed. However, with the severity of the injuries they were receiving, they were concerned that I would kind of get lost in the cracks. So they sent down to Belvoir instead. All right, because it'd be people at Walter Reed more severely injured than you, they and they worry about them, and then not you. Exactly. You're looking primarily at amputations, at multifocal injuries um, who are in need of a lot of extensive rehabilitation. So, somewhat of my priority uh, is, is not as high on the list as theirs. I would get lost in the, in the shuffle. Okay. And then how long did you spend at Fort Belvoir? I was at Fort Belvoir until mid-June of 2013. Um, I had to undergo one more surgery on my head, uh, go through therapy. I was in a wheelchair for two months, graduated to a walker for a month, um, and then had to that undergo a lot of, a lot of rehab. Mm -hmm. oh. So how long total were you there? I got into Fort Belvoir on 26 August 2012 and I left on 18 June 2013. Okay, that's a long time. Yeah. Uh, and then at what point were you able to kind of get around and do some more stuff for yourself? Uh, November 20th I was given the clearance to get out of the wheelchair and then start walking mm -hmm. as tolerated uh, with giant orthopedic boots on uh, that prohibited any movement of my ankles or feet. Um, and I utilized that kind of a walker for about a month. Um, about January I was getting very frustrated and kind of said screw this, we're, we're moving on. So. All right, did you have the option of, of going you know, back home during this time? or? They, they actually tricked me. They told me in theater that I was going to come back. I was putting up a bit of a fuss. So they, they, they convinced me that in Germany I could talk with them and appeal my case and try to go back. But um, open wounds are a requirement. You will go home due to the infection risk. Mm -hmm. So it was a one-way ticket home, and redeploying back to theater requires you go through the redeployment process all over again, which is far too time-consuming mm -hmm. and costly to really encourage its use. So, yeah. so then it wouldn't make sense to go back to a unit which would have rotated back out? or. I, I wanted to. Uh, that's not something that the guard will usually allow just due to cost prohibitions. Mm -hmm. So. All right. Uh, now, by this time, your unit has come back to the States then? By the time you They came out? back in March of, of 2013. Uh, I flew down to Texas to see them and welcome them home um, for about two days and then came back. So they were back before I was. All right. Uh, and so now you're back, you're, you're still involved with the unit and still serving as a medic, is that right? I am still serving as a medic. I'm back with the 11th Service where mm -hmm. I initially started, um, continuing on through there, going to school, and trying to keep in contact with the 507th. I have a lot of friends here still. Okay. Um, now, so this is, so you're, you're coming out, but your, your, your weekend, your regular drill activity is with them rather than with the 507th? Correct. I, okay. Because 507th was simply for the deployment right. I had volunteered for. As soon as that was done and all deployment activities were, were completed, I was sent back to my original unit. Okay. I'm going to bring in one miscellaneous thing that we actually touched on off camera before. Um, you said that like, Iraq or Afghanistan wasn't made for someone who was 6'2"? <laughs> Nothing in the Army is made for someone who is 6'2". The average age that they build these vehicles for, or the uh, average size, is 5'7 to 5'9. So things like sitting in a Humvee, you have large metal bars that are digging into your shins. Uh, no matter how you move, you just don't fit. 
it's just the logistics. Of so that's how, not even Iraq and Afghanistan. That's just the army. That's just the army in general. <laughs> um, well, fortunately, you can norm, doing your normal military duty. You can work around it. You you find ways. On deployments, there's not as much leeway. You're, you're wearing gear that you wouldn't normally wear that takes up more space. Um, things are just more heavy. Physically, um, taller statures are not as mechanically sound. Um, so we just we tend to incur more injuries and more strain. Uh, and it's just a very uncomfortable experience to fold yourself in half for 12 hours a day. Now, when you were in a crowd of Iraqis, did you tower over them? Usually, yes. There were, there were a few who were taller than I was, um, but it was actually something that you could use to your advantage. It was a curiosity point. It would often encourage conversation, which is something we were encouraging. Mm -hmm. So it was, you could use it to your advantage if you wanted to. All right. Um, overall, how do you think the, your, your kind of time in the service has affected you, or what have you taken out of it? My life started when I came into the military, and I didn't really realize that until somewhat recently, that it changes you. Deployment changes you. You don't come home the same person, and you will never be the same person. There is a misunderstanding, especially with the Guard and the Reserves, that you come home and go back to your old life, and that's just not possible. It's very unrealistic to expect, and it's disappointing when you find out that that's not the case. The people at home don't understand. You try to explain it, but unless you've been there, unless you've experienced it, there's just no way to, to really get that message across. And there's so many stories that you try to share, but it, they just don't make sense unless you're in the environment. Um, and you leave a large part of yourself back there. Like I said, there's, there's people I, I cared about that I wonder how they are, um, wonder how things have turned out for them, and I know I'll never see them again. And they were such a large part of your life or a very stressful part of your you know, part of time that it's very overwhelming and it's sad. How does the Army try to help you adjust or to the, what, what's offered to you when you come back to civilian life, you've been on tour, you're in a guard unit or whatever, what will they do for you or what do they tell you they can do for you? They have a lot of services. Um, there's always the VA, which has the, their own services. There's things like the vet centers, buddy-to-buddy uh, -buddy programs. Uh, they, they really encourage that you get involved with those. Um, they're great. I utilize them on occasion myself, but again, you, you almost yearn to go back. Um, there's a part of yourself that you left there and you want to be back there and you just can't. Okay, so we were talking a little bit about just sort of the whole uh, adjustment process mm -hmm. and, and what the, the military can do for you and, and so forth. Um, how much do the returning soldiers, especially the younger ones, actually take advantage of what's being offered? Usually they don't take a whole lot of, of stake uh, with what the VA has. There's a lot of bad rap with the VA currently and oftentimes it's justified. There's a lot of long waits. Um, they're going to prioritize, and if they don't see you as serious enough, you're going to get pushed to the back of the line, um, to the detriment of a lot of soldiers. Mm -hmm. I have a friend who committed suicide last year uh, due to the inaction of the VA uh, and his inability to really get the treatment that he needed. It's not all that uncommon to see, but there are a lot of measures. They're just usually not enough. Yeah. Because one of the things that's characteristic about our recent operations has been the tendency to use and reuse the same units. So yes. the Guard and Reserve units go over multiple times for, for multiple tours. Um, now, I guess from the way you're talking about it, I mean, on, on some level, that would be fine. For the majority of people, that is often enough. Um, just an outlet to kind of decompress and really get back into to civilian life, which is the hardest part, is the returning to what you used to do and putting the soldier aside when you've been doing it for a year actively. And most people are able to integrate just fine, but there are those who had more traumatic experiences um, and they just need more. They just need more care than a simple once a week, hour long counseling. And what about the effects of just having to go, the people who do multiple tours, does that, do you know people who've done that and is that mm -hmm. necessarily? Is that a good or a bad thing? or 
again, it's like most things, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. Uh, they're great at their job because they do it all the time. Their experience and knowledge are just phenomenal. But you take a toll. You take just an emotional toll. Um, constantly being gone, constantly being on edge, and analyzing and reanalyzing. That's a very hard mentality to turn off. And when you come home, you find that it just it doesn't mesh with civilian society. It, it leaves you feeling very left out and detached from what's going on around you. All right. Um, I guess looking back now at the, the time that you spent in, in the service, particularly on those two deployments, um, are there other things that, that ought to get added to the story or impressions that you took out of it that we haven't gotten in here yet? Yeah, the things that, that stand out are is just the interaction. What you get from the culture, what you get from the people, the, the human side that you see, uh, both with the locals of the other countries that you're in, as well as your teammates. Mm -hmm. You are closer to them than anyone on earth. You are, you truly bear yourself to the people that you're with. And it's, it's both an honor to, to experience and to have people put that kind of faith in you. And it's also very humbling. Something that you just don't see elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Do you find that when you meet people who were veterans from earlier periods and so forth, that there, there is some kind of common bond or connection there, or they get more of what you're talking about? There is. Um, there's very much a sense of kind of family. And, and even though you didn't experience the same situations, you may have experienced similar situations. We often end up comparing, you know, it's uh, especially with things like Vietnam, and we find ourselves lacking uh, in the, from the current conflicts. Uh, for some reason, everybody seems to minimize what they've experienced compared to what the other veteran has dealt with. Uh, we'll never see ourselves as noble as World War II. Uh, we'll always see ourselves as spoiled in comparison to Vietnam. Um, so there's a, there's a bit of comparison mm -hmm. to it, but they understand. And so there's, there's a familiarity and a comfort with people that have been there. All right. Well, I'd like to close up. I thank you for taking the time to share your story today. Thank you very much. All right.